The thing that infuriates me most about the cult of woke isn't the activists themselves. It's how everybody else immediately surrenders to their petulant whining. Instead of laughing in their faces or telling them to just get stuffed. Take the Washington Redskins. Here was an American football team with a proud history, a cool name and a great logo. They've won three Super Bowls and lots of other championships, which I don't understand because I know nothing about American football. But of course, the Pearl Clutching Identity Politics Brigade got in a tizzy about their name. And so they crumbled and changed it. They could have kept their logo and changed it to the Washington Braves, which would also have been cool. I'd have taken that as an acceptable compromise. But no. They changed it to the Washington Commanders. A crappy name with a crappy logo. And that means that a defining reference which honoured the American Indians has been deleted from the American consciousness. I'm not sure how that's supposed to help, but then I'm not part of their deranged little cult. The same applies to Uncle Ben's rice and Aunt Jemima's syrup and pancake mix. Both have been deleted. Again, I'm not sure why. The woke activists are doing their utmost to cram black people into every advert they can, but at the same time, they're removing them from their packaging. And that seems like something the Nazis would have done. Absolutely nothing these people do makes sense. Yet wider society keeps bending the knee to them. And this is affecting high art and culture too. It's even affecting the coronation of King Charles III, with reports suggesting that Queen Camilla will break with tradition and askew the Queen Mother crown for a more modest piece. In doing so, she simply surrender into the activists who are kicking up a fuss about the Koh i Noor, the huge and dazzling diamond that forms the centrepiece of that crown. They're bleating all the usual lines about colonialism and imperialism, and of how the gem was looted from India and should be returned forthwith. But as usual, this wailing comes from activists and not historians. And also, as is customary, they haven't got a bloody clue what they're talking about. Kuinor dates at least back to the Mughal Shah Jahan's throne in 1628. But the Mughals themselves were conquerors, Invaders who had come from Mongolia and Turkey to colonise India. In 1739, the diamond was plundered by the Shah of Persia after an invasion which left 30,000 dead. But in 1813, it changed hands again, when it was seized by the Sikh ruler Ranjit Singh, known as the Maharaja of Lahore and the Lion of Punjab. So maybe it should be returned to Pakistan. Wouldn't expect the activists to know any of that, though. Ranjit Singh died when his son was just five years old. And though his widow attempted to hold his kingdom together, war inevitably broke out. The British restored peace and restored the little boy Dulip Singh to his throne. And he willingly gifted it to Queen Victoria in gratitude, signing it away in the Treaty of Lahore. It was not looted. It was Dalip who brought the stone to London and presented it to Victoria personally. A most peculiar form of looting. It was a priceless bargaining chip. And regardless, its history is far more complex than the activists would have you believe. Or that they know. Should it be returned to India, Turkey, Pakistan, Afghanistan? This is why Camilla's decision is so worrying. Because when you surrender to the woke lunatics, they're never satisfied. They are merely emboldened. Their historically illiterate anti-Western rage will simply latch on to other targets. And the clamour to divest Britain of other treasures will grow. And they will inevitably focus on the Benin bronzes and the Elgin marbles. These marbles are also widely reported as looted. But they have a similarly complex history. 
Not only did Elgin legally purchase these from the legitimate authorities, but the Ottomans had been on something of an iconoclasm. They'd also been using the Parthenon to store dynamite, and it ignited, destroying most of that venerable structure in the process. There's much evidence that shows how vulnerable the marvels had been as well. Drawings from 1749 show 12 figures on the west pediment, but by 1800, just four remained. James Stewart had sketched five slabs of the frieze in the 1750s, but by the time of Elgin's purchase, all had been destroyed. Two more pediment figures, intact in 1765, had been decapitated. Elgin didn't loot the marbles. He saved them. And it's very revealing that these activists only wail about treasures they're told to complain about. None of them have anything to say about the Mona Lisa, which was actually looted, though I guess that was taken from a European country, so they don't give a toss about it. Of course, if they get their wish, and a British museum ends up denuded of all its treasures, then these same fools were just tucked that it's disgustingly white. You absolutely cannot please these people. So why try? They're motivated by nothing more than a loathing of European civilization and history, despite being pathologically ignorant about both. And they have no power except that which is handed to them. Stop giving it to them. Ignore them and let them wail in impotence. It's really all they're good for. If you want to support this channel, please like, subscribe and think about buying my books. They're called The Tyranny of the Left and they go into topics like these in much greater detail. They're available on the links below. Please do feel free to pick them up and let me know what you think. Thank you.